Well, I'd like to welcome you back to An Achievable Dream and thank you for joining us for the first part of this comprehensive four-part series on vessel monitoring systems. Over the course of this series, we'll delve into the justification for these systems, how to approach their design, installation, commissioning, and testing. For those navigating in the world of serious long-range expedition yachts, the significance and added benefit offered by these systems cannot be overstated. That said, we also understand that for many of us, ourselves included, the perceived hassle, complication, and associated cost of implementing such a system can feel like a daunting endeavor. Our own journey down this path reflects many of these exact sentiments. Our original system was relatively simple, straightforward, and considering that it predated Windows, was a remarkable feat of engineering and remained fully functional for an impressive quarter century. That said, six years ago, we knew that we could no longer escape the fact that we were living on borrowed time and our system was operating well past its end of life phase. The pivotal decision which awaited us was to either proactively take control of replacing our existing system on our terms and at a time of our choosing or gamble with the potential of a system failure during a prolonged voyage determined by sheer fate. Our undertaking the significant task of installing our own vessel monitoring system seemed to mirror so many of our previous experiences when it came to taking on ambitious new projects, confronting fears, and hopefully the opportunity for some personal growth. When it comes to boating, this is an all too familiar movie, one we have all been to several times before. We decided to embark on what felt like a bold decision and to embrace this challenge head on. The first step in this process and among the most significant hurdles to overcome was first choosing the right system. It took us time to make the crucial decision of selecting not just the right system, but even more importantly, the right company that aligned with our needs. Two was credibility. It was vital for us to determine the reliability and financial stability of the intended system provider, hopefully one that wasn't at its end of life and to avoid our making a major mistake. The third item was support, accessibility, responsiveness, and attitude. These qualitative attributes of the technical support team loomed as a decisive factor for us. Fourth, confronting the unknown. Getting steps one, two, and three right would go a long way towards easing us into the process and helping to overcome this apprehension, which was a genuine concern for us. And lastly, number five, budget considerations. The cost implications of both the initial installation and long-term maintenance weighed heavily on our deliberations. From 25 years with our original system, we had a very good appreciation for just how vitally important these systems are in terms of safety. So not moving forward with a replacement system was never really an option for us. Having spent about two weeks evaluating our various options, we ultimately made the choice to go with the Meritron system. This decision was driven by the fact that they completely dispelled the first three concerns on our list. Moreover, their integrated design software offered a preemptive response solution to our fourth and fifth concerns of allowing us to essentially design our entire system before committing to the project. It is a brilliant approach to marketing from their perspective and a real win for the customer in terms of transparency, proof of concept, and getting to work with their team throughout the process. We will go through the nuts and bolts later, but fast forwarding to three months later, and we had successfully designed, installed, and thoroughly tested our new fully operational vessel monitoring system. Our decision to roll up our sleeves and engage with the process coupled with the invaluable assistance from Meritron, not only empowered us, but also remarkably slashed our total out-of-pocket cost 
by a staggering 80 to 85 percent. The results exceeded our initial expectations by a significant margin. As we navigated through this endeavor, we amassed a wealth of knowledge, improved our skills, and didn't end up with carpal tunnel syndrome from the 700 crimped wire connections. Over the past six years, our appreciation for the significance and benefits of this system has deepened to the point where we now consider the monitoring system to play an even more vital and indispensable role in the ship's overall operation. For all these reasons and more, which we will share with you later in this episode, we felt that it was important to share our experience. Our goal is to share the lessons we have learned along the way by offering a step-by-step -step approach for those who are interested, our insights into many of the unforeseen advantages which emerged, and to ultimately validate the considerable effort to migrate to a more whole-of-boat integrated vessel monitoring system. It's important to note right from the start of this episode that our experience is rooted in our use of the Maritron system, which we implemented six years ago. We want to be clear that we are not experts in this field. We also hold no direct or indirect financial stake in Maritron or its parent company, and we are not receiving any form of direct or indirect compensation from them for creating any of these episodes. The content of this video solely reflects our personal experience, which we hope will be of some value to you. We also want to acknowledge that there are always numerous diverse approaches to tackling the design and installation process on any project of this type, and that there are a variety of alternative monitoring systems available for consideration. We strongly recommend that you conduct your own thorough research to determine which system aligns best with your unique needs and your application. Irrespective of whatever system you decide to go with, the basic principles and steps we outline in this episode should remain relevant and fairly consistent. As mentioned earlier, it bears repeating that we lack formal training or experience in this particular field. Our decision to share our journey stems in large measure from the belief that if we were able to successfully navigate this endeavor, despite our limited technical background, it serves as an encouraging indication that you can too. The two essential ingredients to produce a similar positive outcome will be determination and diligence. In order to grasp the significance of one of these monitoring systems, it's worth a moment to trace back through maritime history and explore how we got to where we are today. Rewinding to the late 19th century and spanning well into the early 20th century, yachts were heavily reliant on coal-fired steam engines and somewhat crude, one-off pieces of machinery. These contraptions demanded a dedicated engineer who would tirelessly tend to the tasks such as stoking the fires, continuous monitoring, lubrication, and ongoing maintenance. Back in those early days, it was a labor-intensive, hands-on approach that was essential for the safe operation of ships back then. The diesel internal combustion engine, pioneered by man in 1903, emerged as a revolutionary new piece of equipment. However, it wasn't until the 1940s that it became financially accessible and widely integrated into smaller ships. Similar to its predecessor, the early diesel engines also necessitated meticulous oversight of intricate mechanical injection and lubrication systems, lots of connecting cables and linkages, complex cooling systems, and were prone to mechanical problems. Over the next quarter century, there were substantial strides in materials, construction methods, quality control systems, and overall reliability. These advancements led to a transformation where engineers were less likely to be deemed obligatory on small private yachts and confined to the engine room while the vessel was underway. This evolution ushered in a new era of yachting and marine exploration by private individuals on small boats who didn't have a large enough boat, budget, or inclination to bring on crew. Over the past five decades, as diesel engines grew more reliable, we were also living through a technological revolution. 
providing us with dozens of new and improved systems. What were once sparse engine room spaces have now become hubs of cutting edge, sophisticated new systems. From elaborate and complex water makers to gyroscopically controlled stabilizer, chilled water heating and air conditioning setups, inverter systems, hydraulics, electromechanical selector switches, fuel polishing systems, electronic engine controls, waste management systems, the evolution of the engine room has undergone a remarkable amount of change. At the same time that technology was bringing forward new electronics, yachts embraced a wave of auxiliary and secondary systems. These encompassed everything from take-home engines and drives to bow and stern thrusters, backup generators, advanced battery charging configurations, closed circuit TV cameras, and a slew of electronic sensors, gauges, and monitoring panels, each tasked to autonomously monitoring that specific individual piece of equipment. This rapid transformation, which has ushered in an exponential surge in equipment, has had a compounding effect in adding to the complexity of our vessels, and in doing so, we've introduced numerous new potential points of failure. If not already there, we are certainly pushing the limits of any individual's capacity to comprehend, diagnose, or repair many of these systems, including, but not limited to, microprocessor-controlled electronic main engines and generators. The deluge of data has reached a threshold where no single individual, especially the captain who is tasked to running the ship, can any longer be reasonably expected to absorb, scan, and process all this information in real time. Meanwhile, while this shift has been unfolding in the engine room, it has also unfolded on the bridge, where over the last two decades we have seen most manuals jump from 40 to 400 pages. The workload for a captain today is far more challenging than it was even a generation ago. Now contrast that, while all of this is happening in the background, a majority of small to medium-sized yachts today are continuing to operate with smaller, lighter, or less experienced crews. With a tenfold increase in equipment and complexity, while at the same time a reduction in crew size, training, and experience, captains are facing an escalation in their workload that is bordering on untenable. There is now a ceaseless torrent of discrete information streaming from the various navigational, electrical, and mechanical systems. Coping with this influx and volume of data is becoming a monumental challenge, pushing captains to make painful choices to either focus on commanding the bridge or devote their attention to overseeing and managing all the onboard systems. The situation is unsustainable, stressful, and raises obvious safety concerns. From a bridge management perspective, today's captains have passed the point of information overload. It's just a matter of when, not if, these forces are going to produce a potentially disastrous outcome. For the sake of their crew, guests, family, and the vessel itself, captains need to recognize this mounting threat and take proactive measures to more efficiently and effectively find ways to manage the increasing workflow. While information holds great power, its value is realized only when it's efficiently collected, processed, and filtered. Otherwise, it becomes mere noise and an additional distraction, contributing to even more information overload, resulting in sensory deprivation. We've arrived at the point where a vessel monitoring system is no longer a luxury or an extravagance, but an absolutely necessary piece of equipment and a vital part of responsible bridge management. We have surpassed the point when any individual can adequately monitor and comprehend all these systems in real time while juggling all the other tasks, duties, and responsibilities required for safe navigation, communication, monitoring of systems, and operation of the ship. The demands are simply too overwhelming and distracting for any one person to be able to be everywhere and doing everything and doing it all at the same time. There are too many systems to manage, too much real estate to cover, 
and too much information to process without being swamped, stressed, and distracted to the point where things start falling through the cracks. To put it more succinctly, we have reached a juncture where adequate oversight is impossible and potential oversights are inevitable. I see two solutions. First, reduce the number of systems and pieces of equipment on board the ship, which I can tell you from years of experience is never going to happen. Or two, deploy a dedicated vessel monitoring system to meticulously collect, monitor, and present all of this information in a highly useful and meaningful way. From a bridge management and efficiency perspective, unless you are a dedicated full-time engineer, taking the time to read and process 99.9% .9 of the extraneous data produced from all these separate systems around the boat amounts to little more than information overload, provides little in the way of useful information, is completely irrelevant and degrades the captain's situational awareness and diverts attention away from the primary responsibility for managing the safe operation of the ship. What a captain really needs to know is any change in condition, behavior, or performance. The rest of the time, this information is noise and a distraction. The systems available today can effortlessly perform real-time monitoring, overseeing an extensive array of equipment, while comparing all that data several times per minute to a critical set of warning and alarm parameters. This oversight extends to propulsion engines and generators where they can consistently and reliably monitor temperatures, pressures, vacuum, oil and coolant levels, flow rates of fuel and raw water, your AC and DC electrical systems, including inverters, alternators, battery chargers, battery capacity, voltage and amperage from multiple battery banks, fire detectors, bilge conditions and pumps, tank levels, hydraulics, air systems, exhaust temperature, the ship's fresh water system, shore power connections, power conversion, leak detection, open doors or hatches, anchor dragging alerts, remote communication capabilities, and more. What I'm really saying here is that there is really nothing I can think of that goes on aboard your ship, either mechanically or electrically, that can't be monitored if you feel it is important. I'll just give you one quick example where a friend of mine on a well-founded long-range expedition boat had a bearing seize on a large high output alternator and within minutes his engine room filled with smoke. He added both a temperature and vibration sensor to several pieces of equipment where he can now monitor and proactively anticipate bearing fatigue. It's important to note that deciding on what not to monitor is just as important as it is in deciding what to monitor. You have to consider possibility versus probability and if that system failure is mission critical to your operation. The efficacy of a monitoring system hinges on its software, flexibility, stability, reliability, support, and how well it is tailored to fit the specific vessel's application. In its essence, a well-designed system collects, stores, displays, and cross-references a multitude of data in real time against a predefined set of warning and alert parameters known as trigger points. When executed properly, these systems provide users with both immediate insights and, of equal or greater importance, historical data through clear, straightforward, intuitive, and easy to understand displays. The fact is that when compared to human capabilities, these systems are infinitely far more accurate, reliable, effective, and efficient in the collection, management, analysis, logging, and the timely communication of this information through display screens, warnings, and alerts. These systems provide peace of mind by ensuring that you will be immediately notified when anything stops operating within the particular parameters which you have set. This information can also be displayed in whole or in part throughout the vessel, from the pilot house and engine room to the flybridge, salon, galley, captain, and crew staterooms, and on mobile devices as well. 
You can think of these systems as guardrails, allowing the captain and crew to focus on other tasks while still remaining connected to all the systems on board the ship. Another great feature of these systems, which prior to 2000 didn't exist, is the ability to now stay remotely connected when you are away from the boat. A well-conceived and designed system will provide local audible and visual alerts when on board the ship and will have the ability to send alert notifications in the form of text messages or emails when you are off the boat. This messaging feature lets you know the nature of the problem, such as fire, flood, loss of AC or DC power, wind speed, depth changes, anchor dragging, shore power, etc. Another very nice feature is that these systems will also send you notification when the problem has been acknowledged and again when it has been resolved. A recent example of this took place when we were off the boat hiking in the forest. We received an email and text alert notifying us that the boat had lost AC power. We turned around and started to head back when we received another notification that the power had been restored. We were then able to continue on our hike. For those of you who are owner operators or responsible for the running operation and maintenance of a long range passage making yacht, these systems are one of the most powerful tools you can have at your disposal in terms of not only the ship's safe operation, control and management while underway, but it performs an equally important function by providing information when at anchor, tied up alongside and even hauled out in a shipyard. On more than one occasion, we have been called back to the boat because of sustained winds over 35 knots. These systems also have the ability to perform continuous internal diagnostics so that if it loses communication with any of its internal components or devices for more than a specified period of time, it will sound a local alert and send out notifications. In addition to a vessel monitoring system being a vital tool when it comes to collecting and displaying real-time information on all the ship's system, helping identify and providing early warning of prospective issues, these systems also provide essential tools when it comes to forensic diagnostics to help analyze, identify, understand, and resolve the source of problems. More on this subject later in this episode when we will illustrate some specific examples. But suffice it to say that I will share with you that after the warning and alert function that these systems provide, this feature is an incredibly powerful tool in terms of diagnostics, which we routinely use and have come to rely on. For anyone who has operated thousands of miles offshore, especially if they are running without highly experienced crew, it is a great comfort knowing that your monitoring system is on duty 24 seven and that it has your back. Putting it a bit more bluntly, safety, security, and peace of mind really is a big friggin' deal when it comes to the safe and responsible offshore operation of a small ship. Overlooking, ignoring, disregarding, neglecting, or turning a blind eye to this information because of it not being available or inadequate crew staffing is as negligent as operating your boat in reduced visibility without a radar. Simply hoping that everything is working correctly or operating within its design parameters is a terrible long-term strategy. Given time, this traditional last century approach to running a large and complicated vessel is ill-advised and will eventually produce very bad consequences. So, if this type of system is so crucial and mission critical to the safe operation of a long-range expedition yacht, then you might naturally be asking why all boats of this class don't have vessel monitoring systems. First and foremost, as already mentioned, it's just good old-fashioned sticker shock. The installed cost of these systems can be prohibitively expensive. From a boat builder's perspective, something that I know a little bit about. The last thing you want to do is to run up the price, slow down the build, or add complexity and thereby increase your warranty exposure. Unless the customer is knowledgeable and experienced, discussing the need to monitor their brand new boat for failures also doesn't usually go over too well. 
Second would be historical reliability concerns. Until more recently, manufacturers of these systems didn't have a good track record in terms of their product's reliability and ultimately their longevity in the industry. The third point I would raise would be the customer interaction by the manufacturer's engineers. Engineers should never be allowed to meet customers. They are generally terrible salespeople who are more interested in describing the state than selling the sizzle. This practice has resulted in overwhelming customers with technical information and meaningless terminology jargon, which all too often ends up being too confusing, frustrating, intimidating, and disorienting. These customers want to buy a vessel monitoring system, not learn a foreign language. The fourth would be resistance to change and rigidity. We have all gotten along just fine without it, so why do we need it? It was hard for most of us to really value and appreciate the need for radar, GPS, AIS, chart plotters, smartphones, or electric windows in our cars until we had hands-on experience. So this is where episode seven comes in and is really the essence of our deciding to produce this four-part series. Our objective is to introduce you to the concept of a vessel monitoring system, to provide a sort of generic roadmap for those who might wish to consider one of these systems and to pass along some of the lessons we learned along the way. We went from literally zero knowledge to the finished installation of our vessel monitoring system in 78 days. I mention this to illustrate that with just a little patience and tenacity, these systems are not difficult systems to install. It is like so many other relatable experiences we have all had to face before. As an end user, you do not need to understand how a computer works in order to use a computer. That's the manufacturer's job. As a high level user, you mostly just need to be able to follow instructions, connect the wires and cables, and it works. This was our experience with our vessel monitoring system, which is why we wanted to share this information with you. We closely kept track of how and where we spent our time throughout this process. About 20% or two and a half weeks of our time was spent in the planning phase, including talking to people and thinking through exactly what information we wanted to gather from around the ship, how and where we wanted to display this information, looking at and speaking with various alternative system providers, which helped us to learn some basic vocabulary and see examples of what other people's systems look like, being very clear about exactly what it was we wanted to achieve, in other words, envisioning the final product, and deciding which company we wanted to work with, which in our case ended up being the Maritron company. The next 10% or about eight days was spent designing the system, which with the help of Maritron and their N2K builder software, turned out to be much easier than expected and was surprisingly fun after getting past the first day. We will cover this in the next part of this series. The biggest chunk of time, about 40% and around 30 days, was spent in the installation phase. Three or four days were spent carefully planning how we would route wires through the boat, which naturally we couldn't help but be mindful of as we were thinking through and designing the system. Another few days were spent making sure we understood how each device and sensor would need to be wired. Seven or eight days was spent actually pulling in new cables, plus one or two full days in removing old obsolete wires. This is a step you don't want to skip or ignore. Then nine to 11 days were spent making up the wire ends, connections, installing and wiring in the devices, installing sensors, displays, and plugging everything together. The remaining time in this phase was spent on housekeeping, clearly labeling every wire and documenting exactly what we had done with as-built drawings and spreadsheets. We will get into this in more detail in part three. This is a tedious process, but it's an important step and is easier than it sounds. After completing the installation, we then spent two days chasing down a few bad connections, which between Maritron's N2K analyzer software, their simple to use diagnostic meter, 
and amazing technical support staff, these issues were corrected and resolved. The balance of our time was spent setting up the warning and alert parameters, also known as trigger points, and testing the system. We will cover this in detail in part four. Installing a monitoring system isn't as challenging as it might seem, especially once you grasp the fundamentals. There is no question that when you weigh the short-term efforts against the long-term benefits of a vessel monitoring system, the lasting benefit eclipses this relatively minor and temporary challenge. You don't need to be an electrician, a programmer, or possess much in the way of a technical background. If we could do it, then it's proof positive that with a little patience, you can do it too. Six and a half years later, we couldn't be more pleased with our having made this decision, having had very few issues that couldn't quickly and efficiently be sorted out. And if we have one regret, it's that we didn't pull the trigger on this project sooner. Episode seven will be broken down into four parts, each addressing key aspects of the vessel monitoring system as follows. In this episode, part one, we will set the stage for everything that follows. The finished product will never be better than your design, which makes this the single most vital step in the process. This episode is devoted to providing some contextual background, introducing a few important considerations, and providing examples that help underscore the need, benefit, and justification for implementing this type of system. In part two of episode seven, we take you through the process of designing the wiring schematics and creating a bill of materials. The more time you invest in the initial planning and conceptual phase of the process, the smoother this part of the process will go, so that you hopefully don't have to make too many changes or modifications. Another nice feature of Meritron's N2K Builder Tool is that it simplifies the process, will do much of the work for you, performs real-time error checking, which is pretty much idiot-proof, so that you don't have to worry about making a mistake along the way. And if N2K Builder says your design is okay, then you know it will work and you can decide if you are ready to pull the trigger and start the installation process. In part three, we will share some of the general guidelines, techniques, and procedures for how best to install the components, pull wires, make connections, and how to document the system. Performing this work yourself has two huge advantages. First, you will reduce your total cost for the system by around 80%. And second, you will both understand and be better able to tackle future repairs, modifications, or expansions yourself. By the time you get to this phase, all of the hard work has been done. And this step is purely the mechanics of following directions, running wires, and knowing how to operate basic tools like wire strippers, using ferrules, and turning a screwdriver. Finally, part four will be devoted to configuring and preparing the system for operation, establishing your trigger points, commissioning, testing, and documenting the system. This is one of the most important phases of the entire process and can require about 20% of your total time in order to get everything dialed in and detailed the way you want it. We ended up preparing some worksheets which we will share with you to help document and streamline this process. So let's get started with this episode's part one on how to approach the design. There are a lot of different ways to approach designing a comprehensive vessel monitoring system. Our preference is to start with a bottom-up approach, beginning with creating an organized list of everything you wish to monitor. If you are replacing an existing alarm system, then you might start by listing all of your existing alarm points, then adding any additional points that you want to monitor. As you can see in the spreadsheet, you will want to have a column for A, the physical location of where the sensor is actually located, or of even greater importance, where the wires from the existing sensor terminate, which is column D. Typical examples of this would be pilot house, engine room, or the aft lazarette. The location will become important because each of these sensors are going to need to be connected to what's called a device, with each of these devices then being connected to your network. Many of these devices are capable of monitoring up to six different sensors, 
So this will become important when determining the type and number of devices you are going to need and where those devices will end up living. Don't worry too much about this now, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. For now, all we want to do is create a comprehensive list of monitoring points so we can better collect and organize this information. Column B is where you can put the description or name of the piece of equipment that the sensor will be monitoring, like forward generator, main engine, chilled water, stabilizer bay, 24 volt DC battery bank 2, and so on. This is important because if you are monitoring your raw water exhaust cooling on each of your engines, you will end up with three or four of these sensors, each performing the same function, but each monitoring a different piece of equipment. Column C is for indicating if the sensor is a digital or analog sensor. The difference being that a digital sensor is really just a simple switch, which typically is preset to open or close based on the occurrence of some event, such as high temperature, high or low pressure, fluid levels, water flow, if a pump is running, a smoke detector goes off, a door or hatch is left open. You get the idea. Digital sensors require a different type of device than does an analog sensor, so this will be important down the road. Columns E, F, G, and H are reserved for the programming of the device, which comes in later in the process. You will need some of this information in order for the device to read and transmit the stream of information coming from each particular sensor. This will become more apparent as you move through the process. I included it here as more of a preview of coming attractions, and it will be useful as part of your permanent history and as-built documentation for the system. Next is to decide how many physical displays you are going to want, where you want to physically locate these displays, the display sizes, which will often be limited by the available real estate and a general idea of what information you might want to be made available at each of these locations. Examples of this could be that you would likely want a large display in the pilot house and in the engine room, maybe a medium-sized display in the galley salon area, and possibly up on the flybridge, and smaller displays in the master, crew, and even possibly a guest stateroom. Keep in mind that each of these displays can be set up independently so that you might have weather in the guest stateroom, providing such items as inside and outside air temperature, wind speed, wind direction, wind chill, and barometric pressure. The galley and salon area will want wind and weather information but power usage and water tankage will be equally, if not even more important. The pilot house and engine room will be the main displays and should be as large as space will permit. You also might want smaller displays for monitoring specific pieces of information. In our case, we have our 27 inch display at the navigation desk, but also have several smaller four and six inch displays on the forward dash, which are typically set to depth wind speed and direction, and speed over the ground. Also keep in mind that you can always decide later not to install any of these displays, but you will want to be sure that you have taken their power consumption, mounting location, and wire runs into account, or you won't be able to easily add them later on in the process. Naturally, you will also need to locate these displays where you can reasonably figure out how to run wires to each of these locations. Now that we have identified all of our sensors, monitoring points, and display locations, you can start to have some fun playing around with the graphical presentation of how you want all this information to be presented. Our suggestion is to limit your focus to the main display, most likely located in the pilot house, because whatever you install on this display can easily be duplicated onto other displays. If you are coming from an older system, where each display was limited to two lines of text, reminiscent of our old Nokia cell phones. It is now a brave new world that more resembles today's smartphones. You will want to give some thought as to how best to collect, organize, and present this information on different pages, known as screens. This is a necessity as you will now have more information than can be effectively presented or absorbed on a single screen without overwhelming the viewer. 
We approach the design and organization of information based on the vessel's three basic operation conditions, that being underway, docked, and anchored, by creating primary screens or user interfaces for each of these conditions. We felt that this would be both a practical and intuitive way to begin and by providing quick access to relevant information to the specific state of the vessel. From this point, you can create additional drill-down screens to provide more detailed data, monitoring, and control of specific pieces or groups of equipment, like the main engine, generators, batteries, inverters, shore power, pumps, environmental factors, wind and sea condition, speed over ground, tankage, compressors, and more, all in greater detail. Once you have identified your initial primary and secondary screens, it's time to start laying out each of these screens to start to look at their graphical interface in more of a final form. It's understood that these will change over time, but looking at these mock-ups will provide you with a top-down perspective and you may discover that you need or want to add a few more sensors and or pieces of information to complete or refine the picture. Maritron, which again is the only system which we have any real familiarity with, provides the software to design and mock up all your screens at this stage of the process before having spent any money or committed to move forward with the system. Up to this point, your sole investment has been your time. Should you decide to proceed, regardless of which system you ultimately select to go with, all of this work will be value added in terms of ultimately viewing your data, the final commissioning, and testing of any system. So just a quick recap to review where we are at. In step one, we are listing all the individual components and or systems that we want to track and monitor. Step two is determining the number of displays, their location and size. Step three is developing your list of primary and secondary screens and the information you will want to present on each of these screens. And step four is mocking up how your finished displays will actually appear in their final form. Step four is an exciting part of this process, but also raises a bit of a conundrum, especially if you have never worked with a modern day vessel monitoring system. We got it quite wrong in our initial attempt to mock up these display screens, as you can see here, as we illustrate our progression. As you can well imagine, it is hard to really envision the practical application from something we had never worked with before. So, to that point, we are going to slow down in order to take a closer look into your screen development, because this is really where the rubber meets the road. The user interface is what you will be working with every day, so it needs to be well considered, functional, and aesthetically pleasing. That said, this is as much a subjective as it is objective process, where the possibilities are really endless, with every boat having different systems, priorities, and desired aesthetics. After six years, we still find that we are modifying, adding, and deleting screens especially when there is something that needs special attention or monitoring. This process can usually be accomplished in less than one or two minutes. Although for the purposes of this episode, we are using the Maritron system as our example, the general principles should not be radically different if you decide to work with a different company or on a different platform. We start with screen number one. This is sort of our global impress your friend screen that essentially contains most of everything we intend to monitor. And much like when you first switch on the ignition in your car, Everything on your dashboard should light up, which gives you a comprehensive confirmation that all the sensors are working. Once you have created this page, 
It will be relatively easy to copy and paste this information into other pages, where all you will have to do is resize the gauges, change the desired image, and or select an alternative way of displaying the information, like displaying a line graph versus a gauge. Admittedly, it does take a few hours to familiarize yourself with how the Meritron software works, and since much of this will be covered in the next episode, we won't get too into the weeds here. I will say, based on our experience, that Meritron has a really terrific technical support staff which will help you and support you before, during, and after your system is up and running. We organized our initial global screen page with the main engine components displayed in the upper left, our 12 and 24 volt DC battery banks are in the lower left, with true and apparent wind given priority by being located in the center of the screen, no doubt a carryover from our sailing days. Our two generators are off to the right, surrounded by tanks, trouble indicator lights, and engine hours, since they were last serviced in the lower right corner. Next, we display attitude, pitch, roll, and speed over the ground, GPS accuracy, sunrise and sunset, local time, universal coordinated time, and outside temperature. Finally, we display water below the transducer and our ship's compressed air system. We typically only display this page once prior to getting underway in order to confirm that everything is working. You can see at a glance on this display screen that the water below the transducer has two horizontal dashes, which indicates a problem. By starting on this page first, we were able to discover that there was a problem and to reset that sensor, which took all of about five seconds to bring it back online. By performing this step as part of our pre-departure check, we weren't distracted or surprised while getting underway. Screens two and three are both devoted to anchoring, with screen number two shown here, giving us useful information on the wind speed, wind direction, depth, our boat's position and distance relative to the anchor. Since our position relative to our anchor is based on GPS, it is also critical to be sure that we are getting an accurate GPS fix, so you will want a GPS status display to confirm this. Since we are at anchor, our main engine is shut down and is no longer a factor. However, we want to be sure that we have switched our battery charger back on. At this point, we are interested in monitoring our generators and battery condition, along with our tank levels, ship's water pressure, engine hours since they were last serviced, plus some other information of interest. Screen three is solely devoted to our anchor watch and is typically our default screen when we are at anchor although we will on occasion intermittently switch back to screen two. The Anchor Watch screen is a very easy user interface for crew and guests to understand. The screen is currently shown as inactive and will stay that way until the drop key is selected. When the amber text saying alert is inactive, switches color to green and changes to alert is active. The center of the bullseye represents the anchor's drop point and the ship's icon represents the boat's current position relative to the anchor. Having the wind direction and wind speed appear on this display is also very handy. The anchor alert radius can either be set automatically or manually. You don't have to ever worry about forgetting to shut off this alert when getting underway because as soon as you sail outside of your alert radius, you will receive an audible alarm plus, in our case, a text message and an email, and the masthead strobe light will start flashing. This screen page, like all the others, are fully customizable, with the biggest danger being that you populate any of these screens with too much information. Screen four is our dock screen. When tied up alongside, we no longer need information on our main engine or generators, except for engine hours in case it is time to perform scheduled service. Here we are more interested in shore power voltage, amperage draw, our shore power conditioner's internal core temperature, and our battery condition. And a reminder to be sure that we remembered to switch on our AC battery charger after shutting off the main engine. 
Wind speed and direction are also important in terms of our dock lines, fenders, or when preparing to depart the dock and get underway. The boat's attitude is useful in case we need to transfer fuel to retrim the boat, and outside temperature is useful when going ashore and an important safety factor when working out on deck in extreme heat or if the decks might be iced over. We also want to monitor our tank levels, most notably the gray and black tanks, the ship or dock water pressure, and of course we want to confirm that we have good internet or cellular connection so that we can receive emails or SMS text messaging when we are off the boat. It's worth noting here that due to the hardware issues, our monitoring system is no longer able to send SMS message. So instead, our temporary workaround is having the system notify us via email. The next three screens, screen five, six, and seven, are for our main engine, generators, and batteries. These are our three most important go-to screens when cruising. Screen five is our main engine screen, which is our default screen whenever we are underway. We might switch away from the screen to check on our batteries, generator, sea condition, or some other area of interest. But when underway, we always leave the pilot house and engine room displays set to this screen. We are all familiar and comfortable with traditional analog engine gauges. Although we might be comfortable and familiar with these traditional gauges, there are four obvious drawbacks. Analog gauges typically do not have any pre-assigned color banding. As shown here, these gauges can be cosmetically enhanced by going through the painstaking task of color coding them with green for the normal zone, yellow or amber as a warning indication, and with red to hopefully alert us visually to a potential critical problem. Second, traditional analog gauges aren't designed with user adjustable trip points in order to provide an audible warning or alert when they go out of the green or normal range. So unless you are constantly staring at these gauges, you will likely not catch the problem until it is too late. Third, unless your gauges have minimum maximum dial indicators, you won't catch an intermittent problem unless you get lucky and happen to be looking at the gauge when that spike or dip occurs. And fourth, since analog gauges provide no history, you will likely not notice when temperatures, pressures, or voltage start to slowly drift within the green or normal zone, which means valuable time might be lost in recognizing or identifying the start of a problem. All of these limitations are solved with a vessel monitoring system. First, because we are working with a digital representation of analog gauges, we can easily, quickly, and accurately set up these gauges with their own customizable green, yellow, and red color bands. These settings can easily and quickly be refined over time to dial in a display that is custom fit for your needs and application. Second, you can now also orient all of your gauges so that the indicator needles are pointed up close to the 12 o'clock position when the equipment has warmed up and is operating in its normal range. A quick glance at this display immediately highlights that the shaft seal temperature is at the 10 o'clock position, which in this case is not necessarily cause for concern since this screenshot was taken before the shaft seal had time to come up to its normal operating temperature. The line graph, located directly to the right of this gauge, is set to show the behavior over the past hour and we can see that the shaft seal temperature is continuing to climb and hasn't yet plateaued at its normal operating temperature. Third, the amber warning and red alert zones can be keyed to different tones as part of your ship's monitoring system and will provide an audible notification when they go out of the green or normal zone. We actually use our main engine oil PSI warning set to 80 PSI in order to adjust our RPM during the warm-up phase on our main engine, so as to make sure to stay under 80 PSI until the engine warms up. The area located at the bottom of the screen is reserved for displaying warnings and alerts. Fourth, the gauge displays can be set up 
with or without minimum and maximum history markers, which can be reset at the beginning of each passage and after everything has warmed up to its normal operating temperature and pressure. The markers can either be reset individually with each individual reset soft key, or by selecting the Reset All Max Min button, which will then reset all the minimum maximum markers on the screen. Another nice feature of these systems is that in addition to just displaying the traditional analog gauge, they can also be set up to provide the exact digital reading from each instrument and, if you elect, these numerical windows can even change color when they move out of the normal range. All of this represents a significant improvement over the old-fashioned gauges. However, the single biggest unexpected benefit for us was the power of using line graphs. The ability to see the history over a user-defined period of time has been one of the single biggest game-changing improvements of working with a vessel monitoring system. It turns out that these line graphs are a far more powerful and intuitive way to understand your ship's mechanical and electrical condition than by using traditional gauges. Indeed, except during the initial warm-up phase, we almost never look at our gauge readings. Once the ship's systems have stabilized, having reached their normal operating temperatures, pressures, and voltages, the line graphs provide much more useful information by highlighting changes in a fraction of the time compared to that of a gauge. Putting it another way, what you are really looking for when you scan your instruments is for any change in behavior. A line graph clearly displays any change in condition, which will show up as a sloped or sawtooth line. Line graphs also go a long way to help ensure that nothing is overlooked and to avoid complacency especially when you consider that on just a 1,000 mile offshore passage, you will be repeating this process of scanning your instruments several hundred times. The workload of a captain during such a passage is extremely intense, constantly having to multitask and reprioritize the workflow, which increases the chance of inadvertently missing something substantial. Line graphs help to minimize the risk of critical oversight. A well-conceived monitoring system helps to balance the captain's workload in much the same way as having a full-time co-pilot or engineer on board with you. Take the following example, which we were just looking at. You will learn more about your main engine in one second of looking at the line graphs on this screen than you will in 30 seconds of trying to take in and process all the information provided by traditional gauges. If everything is running hut, straight, and normal, what you should see are flat, horizontal lines. A quick glance at this page and your eyes are immediately drawn to the two potential areas of concern. First, as discussed earlier, the shaft seal temperature is climbing, which we already decided could be ignored since we know that the temperature is still climbing up to normal. And second, that the ship's compressed air system cycle frequency is increasing, indicating either an air leak or a compressor problem. Viewing the line graph of the ship's compressed air highlights that the problem is getting progressively worse over time. This particular issue was something that we never would have noticed on a traditional analog gauge and we were able to quickly diagnose and repair the problem before the system failed. We were also able to quickly add a new diagnostic screen for the air system so we could more closely monitor the system before and after making repairs until such time as we were confident that the problem was fully resolved. Scalable line graphs allow you to quickly look back over just about any interval of time from the past 1 minute to 96 hours by simply scrolling through the up or down arrows located directly under each line graph. If you have a data logger, then the only historical time limit will be dependent on the size of your hard drive. Often by knowing when the problem first appeared, you can correlate this information with the source of the problem. Line graphs have improved our safe operation, management of systems, early detection of problems, and our diagnostics. Here are a few further examples to help illustrate this point. We discovered that we have a slow leak in our fresh water system, which would have likely gone undetected for some time 
had we not noticed that the freshwater pump was cycling more frequently than usual. By correlating this to the upward sloping line of the black water tank, we were able to, one, detect that we had a leak, and two, that the leak was likely associated with the black water tank, and three, that the likely culprit would be a leaking flush valve. Second, by monitoring the temperatures of the ship's refrigeration and freezers, we discovered early signs of a refrigeration problem in that the compressor was having to cycle far longer than normal in order to maintain the temperature. From looking at this data and eliminating the more obvious issues of a leaking door seal, an evaporator fan failure, blocked condenser coils, we discovered that we were low on refrigerant. Losing your freezer or refrigerator while on a long voyage can prove very problematic, expensive, and is highly inconvenient, to say the least. Without a line graph and logging of temperatures, this issue would likely have gotten overlooked to the point of failure, and we wouldn't have been able to confirm that the problem was actually resolved. Another example would be if a shore power breaker trips, it is often impossible to go back in time to assess if the cause was an aberration, an amperage spike, low voltage, a weak breaker, when the breaker trip, and what the exact amperage load was that caused the breaker to trip. By looking back at the history log over a four hour period, you can determine the exact amplitude of the amperage spike which caused the breaker to trip. By looking back over a longer history, say 24 hours, you can confirm that this was the highest amperage draw put through the breaker, which is confirmed by your minimum maximum dial indicators. Assuming that you are working with a 50 amp rated breaker, this is a pretty good indication that the breaker is getting weak. Traditional shaft packing glands are designed to leak a small amount of water, which they use for lubrication and cooling. Even dripless shaft seals leak a slight amount of seawater and also require seawater to cool the sealing surfaces. Being able to monitor the temperature of the shaft seal tells you just about everything you need to know about how well that system is functioning. This same technique can be used with water-cooled wet exhaust by monitoring the temperature of your wet exhaust downstream of where the raw water is injected. You can get a good indication for the condition of both your raw water pump and the exhaust mixing elbow. Back to our main engine screen where you will see that we also provide 11 indicator lights which will turn red and trigger an alarm if anything goes outside the normal parameters we have established or the set points on our digital sensors. We use Murphy sight gauges with high and low alarm points to monitor our main engine oil level, coolant level, and hydraulic tank oil level. In retrospect, it would be a good idea to provide an RPM and pyrometer sensor along with a fuel filtration vacuum sensor and temperature sensors to measure the delta between the inlet and outlet of the keel cooling system. Here again, you will need to strike a balance between enough and too much information. Screen 6 is our generator drill down page, which is set up very much like our main engine page. Since generators are self-protected with automatic shutdown relays, we elected to scale back our monitoring to just voltage, frequency, amperage, temperature of the windings inside the sound enclosure, water temperature, raw water pump flow, and engine service hours. We also use Murphy gauges to monitor the engine's coolant and oil level in the same way as our main engine. Monitoring your generator's frequency is more important if you have generators that are fitted with PTOs for running hydraulics. Screen 7 allows us to monitor our 12 and 24 volt DC battery system. Here again, a quick glance at the line graphs tells us everything we need to know while underway. For those who have inverter systems, you would likely want to add an additional screen. Screen 8 gives us a closer, more detailed view of our AC dock power and internal temperature of our AC power converters, which is important to monitor when operating in the tropics or during the summer months in the Mediterranean. Screen 9 provides a comprehensive view of the pumps and tanks we monitor and is pretty self-explanatory. Much in the same way these systems can easily keep track of engine run hours, 
they can just as easily track the number of times that any of your pumps, including your bilge pumps, are cycling, plus the total run hours on each pump. This can be especially useful in terms of bilge pumps that might be cycling at the beginning of a slow leak to know how many times they have cycled and the frequency between cycles. All of this is easily monitored with a line graph. As long as we are already tracking our pump's run cycles, we program in a pump overrun alarm so that if our gray or black pump cycles for more than 10 minutes or our fresh water pump cycles for more than 6 minutes, it will trip an alarm. This is especially useful if a float switch were to stick in the on position, an internal pump were to fail, a hose or connection were to break, or a pump was inadvertently switched on and left running. As a side note, we are also fans of bridge enunciator lights so that we can immediately identify any pumps that are running and for how long they are running. As mentioned in part two of episode two, and again in episode five, bilge pump alarms should be set below your bilge pump activation float switch. If the pump's activation switch is located below the alarm activation switch, then you will only get an alarm activation when the bilge pump can no longer keep up with the leak into that compartment. Since you will likely want to monitor your bilge pump cycles, you can also set an alarm so that whenever any of your bilge pumps cycle, they act as a backup alarm sensor by also tripping an alarm. Tracking pump hours is also useful for determining when pumps and or motors should be inspected, lubricated, and overhauled as part of your regular maintenance program. The ship's water pressure gauge and line graph provides valuable information in both confirming the cut-in and cut-out pressure, as well as to historically see how many times the pump is cycling over time. This proved useful when on a recent passage when we noticed that our water consumption and pump cycles were unusually high. After a little detective work, we found the source of the leak. One of our guests enjoyed taking 20 minute showers in the morning. Monitoring your potable water tank is useful for a whole host of obvious reasons. It's useful to program low level warnings and alerts so as to better manage your water supply as well as high-level warnings and alerts when you are either making or taking on water from shore. High-level alerts for your black and gray tank ensure that you won't inadvertently overflow either of these tanks in case the automatic pump were to fail to operate. And a pump overrun timer ensures that you won't burn your pump up if it fails to shut itself off. Screen 10 is what we call our environmental page and is primarily used by gas and for diagnostics on our internal heating and cooling system. We also use this display to check current sea temperature, outside temperature, wind chill, and if the barometric pressure is static, rising, or falling. Screen 11 is for roll and pitch and is mostly used to monitor the effectiveness of our stabilizers, the comfort of those on board, and to check our trim before docking to ensure that fenders are placed at the correct height. We use a slightly modified page in the engine room when transferring and taking on fuel. Wind speed and direction are important since they too can impact on trim. Screen 12, which we use to average our speed over time, shows our current and average speed over the ground for the past one, four, and eight hours. This page, as described in part one of episode two, is primarily used on our multi-day offshore passages and to help us determine our actual versus theoretical rate of progression and to fine tune our ETA at specific weather points along with estimating our final time of arrival to our destination. Screen 13 is really a drill down screen on the tanks and pump screen where we can see historical line graphs paired with the current tank level readings. Screen 14 is a general diagnostic screen and was last used to provide a closer look at our air system for diagnostics. After making repairs, we will often continue to monitor the system to be sure that our repair was successful and that the problem is resolved. Screen 15 is our GPS status screen 
which is primarily used to confirm that the signal strength and accuracy of the vessel monitoring system's dedicated GPS and compass uh, are functioning correctly. This is of vital importance if you are using this system as your primary anchor watch. Screen 16 are all of our secondary, non-analog backup digital sensors and contacts for such items as smoke detectors, flood sensors, doors and hatch contacts, raw water flow sensors for our exhaust and chiller units, loss of shore power, battery charger, and low air pressure. This page is typically only used once a year when we test all of our systems or sometimes with an inexperienced watch standard to help them easily identify an issue prior to waking someone up. Screen 17 is our away page, which we monitor in conjunction with a ring camera setup when we are off the boat and want to keep an eye on our shore power, battery condition, wind speed, main freezer, along with the outside and inside temperatures. Maritron offers this functionality over the internet, but it was back before Starlink was in operation, so we didn't have 24-7 internet. Back then it seemed too easy, practical, and cost-effective to simply use a $50 ring camera, although I will admit that it wasn't the most elegant of solutions. With the advent of Starlink, we might decide to revisit this issue next year. Screen 18 is our galley display and has turned out to be a super useful screen for whoever is working in the galley or operating the clothes dryer to help them understand, monitor, and manage the ship's electrical load. On those rare occasions where we might have to plug into dual 30 versus 50 amp shore power connections, we adjust the alarm on that shore power leg to trip at 25 and 28 amps. Since installing the system, we have completely eliminated tripping either our internal or shore power breakers. This display is also conveniently located for gas to monitor the outside temperature, wind speed, and wind chill before going out. And when we are at anchor, everyone appreciates being able to monitor the anchor watch screen without having to head up to the pilot house on every wind gust. These days, many engines Water makers and air conditioning manufacturers provide an easy and straightforward plug-in which allows the user to export and repeat information directly to a vessel monitoring system. Much of this is useful, can save you time, money, and create a valuable history log. Other than time and money, the only limiting factor to designing one of these systems will be your imagination. This is both the good news and the bad news because it will be incumbent on you to show restraint, to be disciplined, and very clear in defining your system's mission state. The mantra needs to be that the simpler your system is, the easier it will be to understand, the better, more reliable, and more stable it will be. The last thing you want to do with one of these systems is add needless complications or points of failure. In most cases, there is more downside than upside in integrating this system into other onboard systems like your navigation systems, closed circuit TV, or for performing trivial tasks like switching on and off lights, circuit breakers, or adjusting the temperature in each individual cabin. Save that for the mega yachts who have full-time engineers and who the guests can ask for assistance to turn on the lights in their cabin. From what we have experienced, the four biggest risks to a vessel monitoring system will be deciding on whose system to go with, developing a smart, well thought out design, the wiring and documentation surrounding the installation, and fourth, avoiding the tendency to needlessly overcomplicate your monitoring system. This is a mission critical tool, not a video game. A good guide to consider is that if the item you wish to monitor doesn't rise to the level of necessitating a warning or an alert, such as turning on and off lights or adjusting thermostats, integrating navigation electronics or your closed circuit TV system, it should not be included as part of your vessel monitoring system. Here are our concluding arguments in favor of installing one of these systems and for you to consider you doing it yourself. First, reliability. By designing, documenting, and installing the system yourself, 
you essentially maintain 100% control over the installation, your selection of equipment, sensors, wire connections, and the overall integrity of the system. From our experience, nobody will take as good a care of your affairs as you will yourself. Second, maintenance. If you install the system yourself, then by definition you will understand your system, which translates to ongoing maintenance costs and hassles being reduced by 95%. You will be able to modify all your displays, refine your screen designs, fine-tune warnings and alert notifications, and be able to make repairs yourself which is especially important when cruising in remote parts of the world. Third, complexity. By designing the system yourself, you are better able to manage and keep a check on the system's complexity and resist the temptation to simply throw more money at the problem, implementing somebody else's ideas, who most likely has far less practical boating and knowledge and experience than you do yourself. Fourth, in terms of cost, the total installed cost of a well-designed and comprehensive vessel monitoring system ends up being somewhere around 15% in material cost and 85% in labor. So the easiest way to significantly reduce your cost is to design and install the system yourself, regardless of whether you provide the labor or subcontract out the installation. It will be a good investment when you consider the time and cost of interviewing hiring, training, feeding, and housing a qualified co-pilot or engineer. Depending on which way you decide to go, the payback for one of these systems can be measured in anywhere from a few months to a couple of years. Next, safety. When operating light on crew, a well-conceived and installed vessel monitoring system will significantly improve your boat's overall safety, bridge management, and efficiency. A vessel monitoring system, if done correctly, will pay for itself in both cost savings and reliability from the early detection of problems, improved diagnostics, better situational awareness, decreased distractions from sensory overload, and provides peace of mind. Two final thoughts. First, regardless as to how any of us feel about being dragged into the world of artificial intelligence, the objective truth is that these systems provide far greater reliability, timeliness, accuracy, continuity, safety, stability, and history than would otherwise be humanly possible. And second, these are active monitoring systems providing a vast amount of real-time and historical information in a user-friendly, well-organized, and collected manner. Their primary function is to alert you at the first sign or symptom of a potential problem and, secondarily, they are a valuable tool for diagnostics. However, as good as these systems are, they are not a substitute for performing regular maintenance or conducting routine visual inspections. I will conclude this episode by reminding the viewer that this video represents only one methodology as to how to approach a vessel monitoring system. This is how we did it. But as I say in all my videos, there are many paths that will lead to a successful outcome. This way worked extremely well for us, or we wouldn't be sharing it with you. But it is by no means the only way, or the right way, or even the best way. The next installment of Episode 7 will focus on the actual mechanics of designing the wiring schematics, specifying the individual devices and components, building a bill of materials, and some thoughts as to how to approach the installation. Thank you for taking the time to join us on this video, and we hope that you found this episode beneficial. If you are interested in being notified when the next episode is published, please hit the subscribe button. And as always, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to send them along. And we will do our best to get the next episode uh, out to you within a couple of months. Thanks again and wishing you all the best.
We want to provide you a short tutorial on Meritron's N2K View to help get you started in thinking through, laying out, and designing your individual custom screens. Type the word Meritron into whatever search engine you are using. Then click on the Meritron homepage. Select the Products tab. On the drop down menu, select User Interface Software. Next, select User Interface Products. Then scroll down and click on N2K View Vessel Monitoring and Control Software. Next, select Downloads, which will download the latest version of N2K View to your computer. Then go to this file, which is typically located in your download directory, and double-click the file to run the installation program. Click Run to execute the installation of N2K View. Then click on I accept the agreement, then click Next. When the file is done executing and loading the program, click Next to enable the hardware setup. Then select Finish to complete the setup and the program should open. Type in the display name box whatever name you wish to use. Then click Accept. You are now in N2K View. By clicking anywhere on the screen, it will open several drop-down menus. Along the top of the display are several demonstration screens to help get you started. Select the box on the right of your screen entitled Commands and Settings, which will open a submenu. Click on Screen Setup, which will allow you to add, edit, remove, export, and import screens. Let's start by clicking on the Add soft key, which will set up a new screen. You can leave the title of this screen as New Screen, or for purposes of this illustration, try typing in Demo or Your Boat. Next click Add, then click Save to add this new screen to your system. To get you familiar with the software, let's move the new screen which you just created up to the top of the list. To do this, select the new screen you just created in the far left column, then click on Move Up until your new screen is at the top of the list. Your new screen will now be the first screen in your list of screens. At this point, we can get started creating your first screen. I'll take you through a couple of examples to help get you started by creating a main engine coolant and oil temperature gauge display. Start by clicking on Edit in order to begin to populate your new screen. Start by highlighting a rectangle of any size, then click Add, which will provide a list of available options. It's worth spending some time looking at all the options which Meritron provides, but for now, just scroll down to Engine, which will open a submenu of choices. From here, scroll down and select Engine Coolant Temperature, then click Save. Congratulations, you just created your first gauge. The size and placement can then easily be adjusted. Next, let's repeat the exact same process to create your engine oil temperature gauge. Once again, highlight the rectangle to the right of your new engine coolant temperature gauge, then click Add, scroll down to Engine, then scroll down and select Engine Oil Temperature, then click Save. You have now successfully created an engine coolant and oil temperature gauge. At this point, you can click on Save, which takes you out of the editing software, and by clicking on Save again, it will take you back to N2K View. If you are not seeing your new screen, then just click anywhere on the display to drop down the complete list of all your screens and you should see your screen just to the right of the alert screen which always occupies the number one position click on your new screen and it will open to save you some time you can also copy individual or groups of items from other screens and add them to whatever screen you are working on Let's take a quick look at how that works. 
Just as before, by clicking anywhere on the screen, it will open the submenu screens. Select the box on the right of your screen entitled Commands and Settings, which will open a submenu. Click on the Screens Setup tab, which will allow you to add, edit, remove, export, and import screens. This time, scroll down to the Tanks menu. Next, click on Edit, which will allow you to edit the screen, which includes the option of copying. You can click on any individual item in the display and select Copy, or by holding down the Control key, you can select multiple objects. Here we are going to copy four tank gauge displays. Next, click Copy, then close out of the screen. Then scroll up to your new screen, which you just created, select that screen, then click on Edit. Now, assuming you have ample real estate remaining on your screen, all you have to do is click on Paste. From here, you can grab and move and resize the gauges to your liking. When you are done, click Save, then Close and you are back to your finished display screen. I hope that this is enough to get you started. It will take a while to get familiar and comfortable with this program's interface, but once you do, you will be well on your way to designing your new vessel monitoring system.